right, everyone. Well, good evening, afternoon, maybe it's morning for some of you. Um, this is Michael Head, the founder of EOL. EOL, EO Hell, I almost said. <laughs> Interesting. Um, here was my old friend, Deanna. The evil twin. <laughs> We're going to forget about that. Um, but uh, hi, Deanna, how are you? Hey, I'm Deanna Cochran. I'm from the Care Doula School of Accompanying the Dying. I'm the founder of that. And has done many, many things for a long time, including being a hospice RN and training so many people um, in the art of being a death doula and taking care of. So Thank you. Yeah. A company. Um, a company, yes. Um, so we are, I don't know how many times we've done this, but it's um, many at okay. this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and today we get to go on a slow walk with Justin Crow, the founder of Parting Stone. How are you doing, Justin? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be on here having a conversation with you guys for an hour. I appreciate how unstructured this is. Usually they, they're super structured and I'm excited to, to chat a little bit. Oh. Well, we're not that structured. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're going to talk over each other. We're going to redirect. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, well, let's um, let's start with what Parting Stone is for people that don't know. Just the the basics, and then we'll go into like a deeper dive around the process and the the whys. But just like the basic, what is Parting Stone, and what is what is it? What are solidified remains? Yeah. So I'll tell a little bit of the story of how we got there to give some context to what we do. Um, when my grandfather died, first of all, I don't come from the death care industry. A lot of people in the industry now do, but I come from a background in product design, journalism, digital marketing. Um, and when my grandfather died, I started to talk to my friends about their experience with loss and realized that I kept hearing the same answer. And they would talk about these people that they loved and then tell me they were keeping the remains in a closet, a basement or garage. And the product designer in me, like red flags started going off. And I was like, this is so weird. They're in the same paragraph saying that this is one of their most treasured possessions that they own but they're afraid to look at it because they might see bone fragments. They were embarrassed to have the urn out when they brought dates home because that was embarrassing. And uh, they had watched too many movies about scattering ashes and then blowing back on them. And I just thought, you know, we're in the 21st century now. There should be a better solution to, for families choosing cremation. And so we decided to um, invent a new form of uh, human and animal remains which we call solidified remains. So it's the full amount of remains following cremation in a, in a solid and clean form that resembles a collection of river stones. I'll actually show you um, part of my grandfather. So here's, uh, here's a, a little container. I keep part of my grandfather in and a little golf ball because he liked golf. Um, but this is what one of the stones looks like. There's about 40 to 60 of these um, following cremation in a, as, a, as a full person typically. Um, so yeah, that's in a nutshell, what solidified remains are, um, my company's parting stone, uh, and I have a great team and we work to take ashes and solidify them into this form that really give families a, a canvas for their, um, personalized experience, um, whatever that is. Yeah. Deanna, had, had you known about parting stone or was this? No, no. When I was looking you up, Justin, just to kind of, you know, see who you were and what was going on. And I thought, oh, he's not only good looking, but he has an amazing brain. And to think of that is, I'm serious. That is beautiful. The stones that you have right now to put in your home on your table on this. I'm thinking of places in my living room, my front porch, my back porch mm -hmm. to see my person it looks so beautiful. Did, did yeah, I see to, some engraving on there? Did you have engraving on some of those? Not things? yet. Not yet. No. But I mean, yeah, I mean, to, to your point, one of the things that I realized early on is that <laughs> said really kind of crudely, we're making remains not weird. You know, yeah. these sit on my kitchen table, but would you ever have a bag of cremated remains on your kitchen table? Like, not, there's something a little bit different about that. 
Um, and early on, I went through a, we went through a business incubator um, or accelerator program to learn about, you know, the technology we're building and the families or customers that we we're going to serve. And one of the evenings, the task was to pitch as many people as you could about your idea at this chamber of commerce event. And I had my like little, it looked like a little, a giant Mentos. It was, it was human remains though, solidified. It was just like one of the first prototypes we had from the scientists that we worked with. And uh, I remember going to this uh, event and I went around pitching this idea of a new form of, of human remains. And I was like, this is human remains. Like this is cremation remains. And I had 200 people that night, close to 200, ask me if they could hold them. And I was like, this is so crazy that these people have never seen cremated remains. A lot of them definitely never touched cremated remains, yet 200 of them asked me to hold the remains of somebody who they didn't even know. And all we did was change the design. This is a design solution. We, instead of receiving granular cremated remains, we have solidified remains. And it's allowing families to feel close to them and comforted by them instead of having anxiety about whether you know where <laughs> that they've been in the closet for 10 years and you feel bad about it it's it's fascinating yeah well let, let's i want to get back to the kind of i mean the, it is revolutionizing the way that people interact with remains and can interact and just you know we're at the very beginning you launched a um, couple of years ago now, a year and a half, is that right? When yeah, product... just about two two years in October. So yeah, just two years ago. Right. And I mean, you um, aren't from the death care industry, but you also in some way are because you spent um, years working with the, um, the publication. Um, and Connecting so th directors. Connecting directors. So talk a little bit about that time and how that was part of the inspiration. Because I don't want to get people... To the impression that you were just a, a design guy who came in um, and said, I got an idea. I mean, you you actually right. have deep relationship to this community um, and, you know, and, and develop that over time. Tell us about that period. Yeah. You know, my grandfather died in 2014. So this was when I originally was like, there's a, there's a problem here that I think we can solve. And as I started to look more, I've always been interested in kind of taboo subjects uh, and, and talking about them, um, whether that's sex or death or, um, you know, selfie culture or whatever that is. And my background is actually in art. I have an art degree. Okay. Um, and that's where I spent a lot yeah, of I was my, kidding when she said we were talking about sex today, but yeah. good <laughs> bring it all together here, guys. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, art I mean, today. one of, one of my original, I was, I was launching these kind of conceptual product designs. Um, and one of the things that I launched was called Paul, the sexiest iPhone charger on the planet. And it was like this, this mannequin, like a full size mannequin where, where his penis was an iPhone charger. And it was just this comment about like how we're forming relationships these days as millennials and like online dating and so it was projects like that that I was kind of launching on the internet. And, um, and this, you know, was really from that thread of thinking. Do you still have of, Paul Sorry, do you still have Paul? I do. Yeah, do you want to see him? Yes, we got to see Paul. <laughs> All right, he's in the other, he's like on the other yeah, side of this Paul. wall. All right, well, that's, <laughs> you know, Michael, when we do the, these, um, bringing in the, the aspects of ourselves that are normally in shadow, right? Yeah. There's just, it's an adventure an adventure and here we are with paul okay <laughs> yeah this is oh, all amazing all right wow so all right my crew started glad we got that out of the way okay i think we can move on yeah um how did we get there even i don't it was all michael's fault yeah I don't know. so this. Um, so we're talking about you as um, an art student. I mean, that's what you that you studied. Yeah. Um, and then you yeah. went into public territory. Yeah. And so, so to go back to to my experience in the industry. So in 2014, my grandfather died. I was like, I think we can create some kind of solution to this. And um, 
when I looked at the industry, I was just fascinated by by two things, by the industry itself, and then by the current landscape and ecosystem of, of death and grief in the US, uh, which were very much and still are pretty separate and different things that I, I don't feel like connect very much. And I mean, EOL and Michael, I mean, you are leading, you were, you were thought leading the, the death and mortality and grief and how we think about that as a culture, which I super appreciate. And from a business, and, and I'm, and I hope to, you know, have some influence there too, just by this, this new form of remains that we're providing. But what I also realized was that our key to reaching people was st is still the funeral industry. And so early on, I started um, writing for a website called connectingdirectors.com, which is the largest funeral industry publication in the US. And it was really how I learned about the industry. I would <laughs> be like, okay, I want to learn about pre-need. And I would go and be like, okay, who's the best person in the industry, the thought leader on pre-need? And I would interview them. Um, and that's originally how I started to learn about all these different aspects and build my network within the space. And so I feel like at this point, I kind of have a foot in both worlds. We're like, we're very much functioning in the, in the funeral industry. We have 350 funeral home partners um, right now. And also I have a foot in this um, more um, uh, movement, death, death care, death movement, death curious movement. Um, area. Um, and I love both of them, but at this point we need both, you know? Um, and I hope to have some influence in both, to be honest, because I, I think, yeah, I'm excited for what's happening right now, both in the industry and in, in the movement outside of the industry. Yeah. It's an amazing time. Deanna, I see that the questions forming in your eyes. Oh, you know, I love to, when I'm listening to you, Justin, I'm I'm, I am fascinated that because of your background, you, you, you're combining, you wanting to do good. You want to empower others with actual, um, you know, financial, um, reward. And there's a lot of people in the, in the death industry and in the end of life industry sometimes feel like that, that is not compatible, but it is mm -hmm. like, um, there, those of us that want to work in this field every day. This is what we want to do. We have to support ourselves. And so I'm just so, it's like you, you went in, you went straight for it. You went to the funeral directors and got to know them. Yeah. You got yeah. to know them and you wrote, you looked into and you researched, you put some skin in the game. For sure. And I mean, it's a, there's some anxiety that people have around capitalism and death care and in some people's mind it's like well this should be non-profit a non-profit industry and it's and i i don't know i just i i don't believe that it, it should be i mean in an ideal world i think it could be but that's we don't currently live in that world and if i'm if i'm gonna be able to offer this service to the families that we work with we have to be a functioning business yeah. and you know, we could lower our price and lower our price and lower our price, and that would be fine. And then more people would choose it, but we would be able to expand because we wouldn't have the money to expand our facility. And, um, and I, I don't, uh, you know, when I set out to do this, I was like, okay, what price can we put this at that makes it accessible to a large population of people uh, financially while also allowing our business to grow? and reach more people with this service. Um, you know, we get, we get about 30 to 40 handwritten letters from people in the mail every month. And I, and that's like a really meaningful part of this. And in order to get to re and it shows me that we're impacting people in order to impact, impact more people, we need to have the capital to grow. And to your point, getting to know the funeral industry, you know, they have a bad rap a lot of times. Um, my experience with funeral directors is they're, <laughs> you don't become a funeral director because you're like a selfish capitalist money hungry person. <laughs> you know, you, you do it first of all, because you care about people and a lot of them, they just want to care about people in 
in one of the most emotionally challenging times of their life. Um, and, and they do make a profit from that and they make a living from that, but it's not always an easy business to be in either. Um, as a, just a quick example, um, the cremation rate in 1970 was 5%. Today it's 56%. The average burial costs $8,500 and the average cremation costs $1,500. And these funeral homes, great, great granddad built that whole business on how do I make a business and a living for my family on an $8,500 average sale. And when our culture shifted, they started to struggle and they still are a lot of them. Um, but anyway, yeah, it, it's a super interesting topic that I, yeah. I've thought a lot about. Mm-hmm. Walk, us, walk us through the, the formation of this idea, um, mm-hmm. Harding Stone. Like, you know, I understand the inspiration um, and then some of the just exposure that you afforded yourself and the time you spent in the industry through connecting directors. But like, walk us through the, the early idea, like are, were there ideas you threw away at, when mm-hmm. you came to it? And then, t- and take some time with it, go into the actual um, technology piece of it um, and the science of it. How, you know, how did you figure out how to get a beautiful product with not a lot of additives and refine that, um, just the, the process of turning remains into, um, you know, solidified remains. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is not the first iteration of this idea. Um, there were some ideas that did not work and, I, and I'll start there. I don't often tell the story, but it's a good one. Um, the problem I recognize is that the, the cremated remains were not comfortable to live with. And that's what I was trying to solve. And, and also I didn't really like urns. They, I'm a design person and urns were like, I'm never, I don't want to live with an urn. So let's, let's, what else can we do? Um, and so actually our original innovation, our original idea was to create a ceramic glaze to and glaze pottery and ceramic design objects with the remains, um, with a portion of the remains. And that was super interesting. I had a background in, I have a background in ceramics. And so I was able to develop that recipe uh, myself, started a business doing pretty well. We got national press on the Today Show and um, I think it was the Guardian and, um, and that was great. And I actually quit my job. So I was like, this is cool. I'm making some money. And I was a writer at the time. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I, want to gr- I think we solved a problem. I want to grow this business. And what I, what I realized is that we did solve a problem for a lot of people and that they wanted a more comfortable, meaningful way to live with their loved ones. But what I also realized is that they had 10, nine cups of ashes left over that still ended up in a closet and it was still causing anxiety for them and some guilt even. And I was like, okay, we, we solve part of the problem. And, you know, I was looking at, you know, the, the ashes into glass products and the ashes into jewelry and the ashes into diamonds and the ashes into vinyl records. And I was like, okay, these are all, and we're in that ashes in the glaze, ashes in the pottery. Um, and then I, what I realized is, is, is that they were all putting band-aids on the problem, which is, is these cremated remains are not comfortable to live with. Let's band-aid it with, with this keepsake. And that's fine for, for, for people who that's meaningful for. But I was interested in, and I was like, can we just solve the problem instead? And can we just create a new form of remains? And the first test I did was I took um, a little kind of cup of cremated remains and I poured ceramic glaze into it and I mixed it around and I put it in the kiln and it came out this weird chunky solid thing and I was like whoa we could potentially do that to, to the entire amount and that would solve the problem and that was kind of the starting point for this and we applied for a grant to to work with Los Alamos National Labs um, with their scientists, uh, their uh, advanced material scientists who typically work on nuclear submarines, uh, took six months of their life to consult with us on the best way to solidify the full amount of remains into a form that was actually comfortable to touch and hold. And we explored, you know, bricks, 
we explored like dome shapes, we ex ex uh, like Tic Tacs, we did a bunch of different design solutions. Um, but what was ultimately by far the most positive response were these kind of river stones. And what was clear was that people didn't want another product. They wanted, a, they wanted a form of remains. They wanted this to be and feel like a naturally organically occurring thing, um, which is what we're, which is what, what we do. Before you get into the process, talk about like, how did the stones, when that, where did that idea come from? Was that just obvious? Was that like, well, it was not obvious. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> You know, I talk about that, but then t t I want to know what the the science of it is, if that's okay. Yeah. But, yeah. And I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's proprietary, and you can't talk yeah. about it. And I don't know what's in the unknown, but we have a patent on remains that look like rocks, <laughs> which <laughs> I really like. Um, um, okay. Yeah. So we're going through these design variations. There was some technical issues with solidifying the full amount and also it wasn't that convenient it looked more like a gravestone than a something you want to put in your home um, and then we tried these uh, as like a step away from ash like some tiny tiny pebbles and we're like okay this is better than ash but you know conceivably i understand how you can get there and i heard so many jokes about breath mints that i was like this is not the right solution and we made them a little larger into river stones and just watching people hold them and hold them against themselves. Mm -hmm. And it was the only design we tried that people, their natural reaction was to bring it against themselves. And I was like, this is what we want. This is, this is meaningful. They're like feeling that, like that's a meaningful experience for that person and that family. Um, and that's really how the design um, got decided on was just observing what was most meaningful and the body language of the people holding it. You know, Ash would be like, uh, the breath mints would be like, here's a joke, but the stones would be like, it was, it was kind of quiet and it felt special. Mm -hmm. I'm and imagining, so science, I'm sorry, go ahead. Water. I'm imagining water like I would want if I had some I would want to create like a waterfall like a, a loop and then have them there I could just see so many things that would be lovely and flowing and yeah yeah and they're they're beautiful in water and a lot of people um, do incorporate them into water whether that's dropping them in a river leaving them on a beach putting them in a fountain um they're definitely, they lend themselves to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it, it solves the problem of, even if you are distributing the, the you know, the cremated remains um, and mm -hmm. throwing them in a body of water or taking them to a special place. Um, one, there's often many locations you wanna take a loved one, not just one mm -hmm. or multiple, or you want mm -hmm. people to have their experience of who's, throwing the ashes or positing the ashes. And then you have that problem with the wind and it getting in your face. Yeah. 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 And it's illegal. It's illegal places to throw cremains into the water. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. And we find that. I mean, what we're finding is that this, by presenting remains in a solid form, they're becoming both more precious and less precious for that family more precious in a way that they want to hold them and be far more intimate with them than the cremated remains. Um, but less intimate in a way that they want to give them to everyone. They want to give them as a gift. They want to distribute them and, you know, all of, they want to go, go back to all the vacations they went on together and leave one in each spot. Um, and you don't get anxiety about leaving a stone because there's, they're abundant. There's 40 to 60 of them. Uh, and we find that that's that amount. Um, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if we receive 10 cups of ash, we'll receive, return 10 cups of stones. Um, we, all we do is compress the material, but th the volume really empowers that family to be like, yeah, let's do something with these. They're, we don't need to hoard them. Yeah. 
Well, and t tell us about the science. So mm -hmm. it's compressed. But and do you have to add anything to it? How do you? Um, there, uh, there must be some magic trick. And can you sure. put them in water, or will they eventually Absolutely. grow? Um, that's actually our most common question, um, which I'll get to. Yeah. So um, the science is. So it's uh, okay. So when remains come out of what's called the retort, the cremation oven, um, it's just it's um, bones. And then a funeral director will put them into what's called a cremulator and blend them into what we know today as ash commonly. And we'll take that material and we will refine it into, in a, into a finer powder um, and add some water and a small amount of binder, which is like a, which is like a glass. It's a naturally occurring um, material that's mined. Um, and so we add a small amount of that to just to bind it all together and turn it into kind of a clay-like material. And from that step, the, the stones are formed um, with a combination of um, some mold making, some hand forming, um, and the stones are then taken and put into a kiln, uh, which looks a lot like a ceramic pottery kiln, uh, which is heated up hotter than the temperature of that original cremation. This is where the stones get their hardness, their permanence, um, when they come out of that kiln, they act a lot like ceramic, um, like a coffee cup material. They're not gonna, they're not gonna dissolve in water. They're not gonna scratch with your fingernail. They're gonna outlast us on this planet probably for thousands of years. Um, and they are then, and then we then polish those those stones so they're nice to touch and hold um, for that family. And then we then um, package them up um, really beautifully in a cloth. Um, cotton bag and a wooden box and then return them to the family. It's amazing. I've, it got, I've, got, I've got many questions, but Dan, I want to give you an opportunity to. Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm pondering still. I like your brain where it's going. Please continue. <laughs> yeah. And one thing that's been interesting starting the business is you know, when we first launched, I was kind of like, who's going to want to work at a death care company where, you know, you're working with hundreds of decedents, dead people at, you know, and I look, I go into these funeral homes and I'm like, ah, do I really want to create like a company like this? It's kind <laughs> of dark. Um, but what is super interesting is, and I see this paralleled in the, the end of life network is that there are so many death curious people who are not, who don't see it as morose or dark or creepy. And, you know, it's, it's, I feel grateful that they have found us and that we have found them, but it's so special to walk into our laboratory every day and see, you know, 10 people with their, with, working with the remains with gloves on but like they're handling the remains they're caring for these loved ones through each step of the process um and david bowie is playing and they're like where they have tattoos and like I, you know it's like i'll have funeral directors through the lab and their first question when they leave is always how do you do your hiring and i just think we've we've tapped into this the same kind of type of of death curious person that EOL Network's all about. And they, they've kind of uh, uh, accumulated here at our company, which um, has ended up being really fun. Honestly, I would describe our company's culture as fun and playful and precise. And, and yeah, that's been surprising and, and um, something I've really enjoyed. Amazing. And I have to say, I, I don't find it surprising at all, but I know I was surprised when I first started too. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I was like wondering when I first started the school, you know, over 15 years ago, I thought I was going to be getting young people, like very young, mm -hmm. you know, 20, 25, you know, 30, and that were curious, like you say. But what happened is people, that have this heart, they want to serve, they want to give in this way, they want to make things better and more beautiful, if mm -hmm. it's possible. And they want to be part of helping people see they do have options and choices. And that sounds like who's working for you. Yeah. That sounds like yeah. they come in all shapes and colors and sizes and 
tattoos, yeah. no yeah. tattoos, right? All religions. And yes, we are playful. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. And we have, you know, we have um, retired people. We have mental health professionals in school for, for grief counseling. We have artists, we have scientists, but what they all have in common is that they, they want to help people through this and they're, and they're not weirded out by death. They're, they think it's, they, they think about it just like they think about anything else and they see it as a vehicle, um, to create a meaningful contribution to someone's life with their work. Yeah. How do you think, um, well, how, how have you perceived it impacting grieving? Um, mm -hmm. I have some, I have some ideas actually, and, and a personal experience um, with friends of mine, but, um, but, and how do you think it, you know, cause this is just the beginning of this adventure, right? Um, you're still just being discovered. Um, mm -hmm. There's something, there's a network effect. There's a scale effect when this is, um, really established as a as a ritual um, mm -hmm. you know, for humans, a part of the ritual or a new ritual. So just, you know, how do you think it's impacting grieving now? How do you think it can impact grieving? Yeah, I think one thing that's been really clear in the, the letters that I've read is that it's transforming this experience of grief and even living with remains from one that could some, can sometimes be really solitary to one that is based in community because the people that take an urn home and they put it on the mantle and it sits there these people that we work with are not those people they're getting the remains back and and they're like who was important to this person who else can have a stone and grieve in their own way so i think not it's not only helping the caretaker of the estate i guess who's receiving those remains but i think it's having a ripple effect on all the people around who, who loved that person to have an intimate gr grieving ritual, whether that's keeping it forever or keeping it in your pocket or burying your backyard or throwing it in a river. Or throw, we even see people throw it off mountains and uh, whatever that is, it, it's allowed for a really personalized ritual for a lot of people who knew that person. Um, yeah. And I'm going to, touch one on uh, Julie asked about color variations yeah. and um, I can talk about color variations and a, and a, like a really special ritual that I heard about recently. Um, so what's been fascinating is that while all cremated remains are more or less the same color and texture, all solidified remains are different and they're unique to that person. Our process is the same every time. Uh, so 75% of the time they'll come out white and smooth, just like you saw my grandfather. Uh, 20% of the time, they'll come out a hue of blue or green, which is really beautiful. 5% of the time, we're getting these radical variations, like browns, deep blues, greens, yellow, like uh, honey yellows. We even had a black stone, uh, swirls in stones. And we don't totally know why it happens at this point, to be honest, but it's so interesting and beautiful. They're all beautiful. And a story I heard recently, um, we've, we've read a lot about families having these reveal parties when the solidified remains come back, where they don't open the box until they take it home and they, have, they gather with their family wow. and they open it together, which is unprecedented, like to be excited to open the box of remains. Like that, that was an experience previously yeah. that people, you know, excited, but sad, but grieving. I mean, it's a complex emotion. Um, but the story I recently heard was that a family picked up the remains um, from the funeral home and it was her father and she was getting married that weekend. And the funeral director said, maybe, um, maybe you should wait to open it with your family uh, at the wedding. And she decided to do that. So she waited, brought um, the box to the wedding and had a moment there where they all opened the box together. And the story that I was told was that the theme of the wedding uh, was all blue. And when they opened that box, all the stones were blue and they got to take them out and lay them across the table and just have this amazing um, special moment. Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, so much of the healing that, the way we've structured healing 
is that it happens in isolation or on retreat, often with strangers. You know, you, yeah. you work with your therapist, um, you or you're in a, you know, you're in a, a surgical ward. Um, it's not a communal event. Um, you go to Esalen or you go to the Landmark or you go to t Tony Robbins or whatever it is, some big life experience at a retreat and you try to bring that changed consciousness back to your community or try to bring what you're learning in your the new dynamics of being you're learning from your therapist and you try to bring it to your family like good luck it's hard <laughs> yeah and and you're offering a type of um memorialization honoring grieving and healing that is, is that by its very nature is is in is community driven um has has the you know the invitation to that has the yeah. ability to um to invite and hold a community experience um which we don't have after it's you know you can stay kaddish um in community for 13 months um you can go through the 40-day mourning period in um, islam um but it's doesn't have the same community dimensionality it feels like of of, of this um, in mm. some um yeah and one one another story that related to that um this happened really early on and i've heard and i personally experienced it but i heard other people i've heard other people tell me a similar thing is that um they'll wait to hold a memorial for that person until they get the solidified remains back um and then they will, they'll ask us, we have these little tiny bags we call sharing bags. They'll ask us for, you know, 50 sharing bags. And then at the memorial, they actually invite anyone who wants to take a stone home with them to come and to take a stone home. Um, and it kind of speaks to that, just like it's a community. It, it, in the, the design experience, the experience of the remains invites community involvement. Um, and the, yeah. Well, I mean, what you're tapping into too is a huge um, community that um, their spirituality is Wiccan, is earth-based traditions, is um, shaman uh, hmm. shamanism. There is so many um, stones is very powerful. Um, we use for all kinds of things, healing stones, this and that. So I could totally see this because you're not, you're making it movable. You're making it transportable. And like you said, the reveal is awesome to bring mm -hmm. people who want to get together for that. I totally can see mm -hmm. it. And it invites you to have a ritual. Like you can't do this mm -hmm. without some kind of ritual, right? Mm -hmm. So it is bringing, um, Michael, you were talking about how do you see this affecting healing, grieving and all that. And he was reading beautiful letters. And then those of us who are in this space already, um, you know, bringing consciousness and ways people are always wanting in in our school is like well how can i help facilitate ceremony ritual and this and that if mm -hmm. the family's not conscious of it but wants it you know um so people are already thinking like this they're not trained priests or shamans they just want right. to be able to offer something and this is something totally it's an, a total um yeah and I'm people gonna... yeah they want that they want that personal experience i've heard that over and over and um i'm just thinking about you know the relationship to cremated remains versus the relationship to solidified remains and i was in a funeral home uh last week um in austin one of one of the partners that offer this option green cremation right yeah oh cool yeah yeah and they're great there um and they get it and um and I was listening to, ah, man, I shouldn't have told you who it was. That's all right. I don't think I'm lying. Um, but I was listening to a phone call and this is really common uh, in the industry. And a standard question is, do you want the lid glued on the urn? And I, I remember entering the, in, uh, getting into the industry and being like, what kind of question is that? And then they found out I was from an art background and they would start asking me about adhesives. Like, what's the best adhesive? I'm like, this is crazy. This is crazy. Like we actively like get so much anxiety that we're gluing the lids on these urns. And it just kind of like highlighted again for me why we're doing what we're doing is that that shouldn't be how we feel. 
uh, well, around I guess our a lot loved of, ones. Yeah, there's a lot of fear to every aspect because yeah. people just there don't know. So removed from everything. I, I'm reading this question, um, size and shape like pebble, like stones mm. for babies. I mean, babies, mm. what do you do with the little ones? Is there yeah. anything different? There's so there's a little bit, it can be a little bit different. So, um, yeah, we actually received um, an order today um, for two um, infants, which was su really sad. And we've, we've had, we've worked with um, these families before and, um, and you just get, it's really sweet. You just get one or two little pebbles back um, after, after the solidification process, but you can still, you know, hold them, feel yeah. close to them. Um, and we need, you know, what we're basically just doing is taking that material and compressing it. And we need us, we need a certain amount of material to be able to, to do that. Um, but if in some in instances we don't have enough material, um, we will um, basically take a little bit of, um, uh, additional binder and add it to form a little bit more substantive of a stone with those ashes obviously being a part of it. Um, but that's that's the only difference. Because um, you and provide the service for pets of all shapes mm -hmm. and sizes as well, right? Yep. Isn't that yep. People, pets, absolutely. We did a fish. Yeah. Um, there is a question. Have you done fish? People oh, have... yeah. Wow. Did a fish, did a chicken, did a ferret, did a horse, did a hamster. That as customers came in with those, not just as a, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, I mean, I guess it's not surprising, but it's, I'm surprised. Um, I'm surprised and, yeah. at the horse. I've, I don't know how many people have experienced a horse death, but I have. I don't know how, how many stones did you get from that horse? So we did a fourth of the horse, a quarter of the okay. horse, which was about two full people. It was a lot. Um, and that, that man, uh, we followed up and we're like, what was your experience like? What did you do with the remains? And he told us about how he scattered them all over his ranch, um, which was really nice. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I thought that was great. So while he's working on the farm, while he's riding, he'll see the stones here and there. Um, yeah. And are, do you find that most, I mean, are you having people, there's a question that came in um, mm -hmm. about, from Josefina, um, are, are you finding more and more that people are opting for this for themselves? Um, or is it, is primarily the family finding this as an option post-death mm -hmm. um, and, and, and thinking that it's great? Or the third people realizing, you know, I think you quoted me something like there's, was it 30 million people or something with cremated remains in a closet in their house somewhere or something like that? Yeah, I actually updated that research and it's uh, just about 70 million people in the United States currently living with cremated remains. That's close to 20% or 18% of our total population. And probably most, most of them in the box that they came in from the crematorium. You probably can't know the number on that, but we'll assume. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not often. I don't, I don't think that people scoop, scoop any out or unless you're gonna scatter or something like that. Right, um, and that number doesn't include people with urns in there or is it, does it, it does? Yeah, it's any kind of, yeah, living with remains in urns or in boxes or animals or human, um, yeah. That's yeah. all of them. So walk us through the what you're seeing from is it is it people opting for for themselves or maybe you don't get to know that. Mm -hmm. um, as we do much. sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So we do we hear from our funeral homes that there's a lot of pre need um, people choosing this form of remains for themselves. Um, we also will get people reaching out to us, uh, and usually usually they're just really excited that this is an option and imagine their their kids. Um, take you know taking them as this as this new form we even had one person a couple of weeks ago send us a an image of a uh t-shirt that he made that said grandpa rocks and had our logo on it 
and that's how he told his family that he wants to be solidified remains when he dies he gave these shirts to all his children which i thought was fascinating that like he he loved the idea so much of of not being left on a on a shelf or scattered that like his family could like have him um and we loved that i mean that was so interesting um but yeah, people are choosing this for themselves uh, as well. Uh, and one actually, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. there's one in particular um, really early on. This was a really moving moment. Actually, it's the story I told earlier. It was the preface to that, which is um, it was a woman uh, dying of pancreatic cancer and it was terminal. And she heard about our company. She's here in Santa Fe. Uh, and asked if I would come over and share with her what we were doing. This was really early on. I don't even know if we had a website yet. Um, and I went over to her house and showed her what we were doing um, and spent an hour with her. And uh, at the end, she was like, this is what I want for myself. And I, went all, I want all of my friends to experience this. And two weeks later, she died and she had planned her funeral. And this is the story I told about going uh, and dropping off the solidified remains at her memorial and everyone there got to take home um, some of her remains. She had planned that herself. Um, that was that was super powerful. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's I mean, it's what actually um, it's just so you know, Justin, it's what is has is indicated um, in, in my death directive and what people know um, mm. is to, that I will become uh, at some point Oh, uh, parting stone. Um, oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Yeah, me too. I, I'm going to sign up now too. All right. All right. I mean, oh, that's I, good I to know. It is um, this idea of it changing our relationship to the dead in a in a way that does allow us um, access to what we know to be the most um, uh, powerful way of grieving. Um, which instead of forgetting the dead or getting back to normal um, or mm -hmm. re-entering normal life is this idea of taking care of the dead, which is, is in every you know, culture um, since time began, there have been, there are so many instances of our relationship to the person that died been, been one of caretaking, of, of retaining a connection as mm -hmm. opposed to getting over it and getting back getting through the, yeah. the quote unquote five stages even though most of us know that that there aren't five stages of grief and that was yeah um a, a, a great mistake um but that that it really embodies this um this wisdom and it you know i saw it firsthand with with my my friend um kiwi who i sent to you mm -hmm. uh, and um she, th this was a tragic death her father died mm. uh, and there was a, so much that went wrong during and it was during COVID um, mm. during um, his last um, you know months and weeks um, in a hospital and um, contracted COVID but everything I mean potentially you know malpractice um, level um, mistakes mm. not and the when they heard about Parting Stone, um, this fa the family, there was this, this light that's just started to emanate from them. And it has become maybe the one good thing in, oh, wow. you know, a tr really tragic event that they're still reeling from. And they're so, pr you know, they were like, I want to show you the stones and it's so beautiful and it's so meaningful and we gave someone. And so it's not you know this isn't coming from the ceo of <laughs> founder like yes you know for those listening and those that were listening to this recording um it, it really it has a powerful healing effect on the family so it's 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 just been extraordinary to watch yeah and we've we've worked with about 1800 families at this point um which is a huge number <laughs> um over the just in two years and um, i'm excited for this moment that you were referring to earlier this kind of critical mass moment because like 
it's just, just education. Just a lot of people don't know that when you choose cremation, you don't have to receive ashes anymore. There's, there's another option now that feels comfortable. And um, the more people we can educate on that, the more people we can help. And um, it isn't right for everyone, but it's right for some people. And yeah. the families we worked with, reading in the, in the letters, they, they, it has had a meaningful impact on their lives. And I'm excited to do more education, to spread the word, to get in more funeral homes, but also to work with people like you and AOL, uh, who do have, who have a megaphone to the industry to, as to like, not just parting stone and solidified remains, but educating like everything that's available that maybe a funeral home might not know about or might not share. Yeah. Don't leave out the doulas. That's and right. the doulas or, and the don't celebrants. Leave out the doulas. We will yeah. bring them to everybody as well because you have people like that that might not call themselves doulas. I'm just kind of um, all sure. over the world that are trying to make things different and bring options to people. So, yeah. Um, advocates there's healthcare advocates there's all kinds of people trying to make good change um i have here um somebody asking about eight ounce coffee cup an eight ounce coffee hmm. cup of remains of ashes could what how much can you make with that um so it's about a one-to-one -one ratio is kind of how i look at it so let's say if you send us a cup of ashes you'll get about a cup of stones back um so if you imagine those ashes in that eight ounce coffee cup as filled with river stones, that's about um, how much you would get back. And yeah. then do you say what the size is or do you just have to take what size comes back? Yeah, it's kind of the result of the process. Um, uh, so we don't, there's no kind of customization in terms of, of like shape or how many it's, it's what comes out. Um, yeah, but they'll all be beautiful. <laughs> hmm. Well, and that's, already, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, we're 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 in our last five minutes, so it's the lightning round of questions. Anyways. Oh great! Oh cool, my favorite. This is this is good. Um, so the, <laughs> the the size and shape is determined by what? Um, the, currently the size and shape is determined by the lab technicians that we have that hand roll the the stones. Yeah, got it. Um, this is this isn't coming from well. Well, let me let me get to a couple of questions here. Deborah wants to know: sure. Can um, ashes be um, sent to Parting Stone from another country and shipped back? I.e., are there any um, is there any weird jurisdiction about where you can throw send remains? Yeah. So currently, we only work with Canada. Shipping human remains and animal remains over country borders is challenging, um, and so we haven't we haven't done that yet. <laughs> Um, but we do work with Canada cause there's, it's, it's, uh, easier, but we do want to expand to other countries. Um, Australia is on our map, uh, or our, our radar. I saw somebody from Australia and Europe is also on our radar as well for potential expansions over the next five years. Don't you have a guy that you can send a contraband package to somewhere in, um, in New Mexico? Hey, if you've got a guy and you want to send it in, <laughs> I'm don't tell me about it, but I'm not gonna, you know, that'd be yeah. fine. You'll make <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then what is the uh, Mary Pat wants to be a, a parting stone educator, so I think you're gonna be hearing. Oh, cool. Line. Yeah, there absolutely. Shoot me an email line. for sure. Yeah, Mary Pat, good thinking. And yeah, what is thanks, the Mary. um for um parting stone? Yep, so for uh people for human remains, it's uh six hundred and ninety-five. Um no matter how much ash you send same price um same for dogs which oh man i don't even know the price on i i'm this is bad that i don't know the price but i think it is 345 or 395 if i remember right and then uh cats are um 50 or 100 dollars below that right and it doesn't cool. yeah, yeah and it's all on our website as well there, the, uh, there's some other options like, you know, or friends of a, a turn of a, um, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, where you could probably do both, right? You can absolutely do both. And we find that families are doing both. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. We love eternal. I, I missed that. Both what? Um, they're getting diamonds and solidified remains or the oh, okay. ashes into glass or the, the keepsake jewelry. 
um, yeah, they can do multiple things for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think my, I guess my last question, and maybe Deanna, you have um, some closing thoughts or question, but um, when are you um, bringing out the designer line? You know, um, I, <laughs> I want to make sure I want it to look like this. Um, is that is that in the near future, or I'm guessing that you no, know, and you're going to stick to a, a very clean model, but very curious. Yeah, you know, we we really see this as a form of remains, not a product, and um, so we're going to stick with um, a collection of stones. That's that's the form. That's the new form of remains that you can choose. What we are doing, which we find fascinating, is that a lot of families will talk about searching for months to find the perfect glass container to display them, or working with a woodworker to have twenty boxes made for all of the kids and grandkids. And what they're describing is a merchandise market that doesn't exist right now that would help families. Because right now it's all cremated remains merchandise, it's, which is all based on how do we hide and conceal and protect and band-aid the experience. But a solidified remains marketplace might look like, how do we display these? How do we make them touchable, holdable? How do we encourage that? You know, and this is actually one of the prototype products that we um, have been looking at is like a really beautiful glass container and when my other grandfather died, these containers went to, um, I think, five of us in the family. Um, and so that is something we're looking at, like uh, uh, objects that can enhance the experience for the families if they choose. Obviously, you don't have to get products, but we're finding that it is having a meaningful impact on the families that we're working with. And we want to, we're always trying to figure out how we can... Um, nurture that. And um, some of these containers and products and jewelry are, are kind of the next step, it seems like. Okay. Amazing. Yeah, I love it. And anything, um, last thoughts, Deanna? Questions? Yeah, Any you know, you're showing us, Justin, something I've believed in, you know, ever since I started. Each one of us has a brilliance. Each one mm -hmm. of us with our unique past can do something. It doesn't matter what it is. And People think, oh, I need to be medical to make a difference, or I need to do this to make a difference. But you're showing right here, you know, your beautiful spirit, your ingenuity, you're bringing things to the table that will change lives. And any one of us can do that. And thank you. Thank you for being with us and sharing all this. Yeah. Thanks for saying that, Dan. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know. I, I think about it like, hearing um extraordinary music or something when i first heard about parting stone um it was, it was like that makes so much sense and i can that makes sense in my head but i can also feel it yeah, yeah. Um, and like you said people just did this right and they wanted mm -hmm. to touch them that is a that's a breakthrough in you know at least modern human history um that Absolutely. i know of. and so yeah, yeah. um I hope you're proud of yourself because we're all real proud of you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, do, I do feel pride in what we've done and I couldn't have done it without an amazing team that, that we have here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We have a laboratory, we have an amazing production manager, Kelsey, and an amazing director of operations, Amy, and our uh, sales rep who came from the entertainment industry and just threw himself into the death care space uh, named Brendan and a um, marketing team and all of our production technicians like this what this is doesn't exist without them so I, I you know I want to make that clear too <laughs> Absolutely. well um, thank you everyone for for thank joining you. us um, yeah thank you all so much for for listening to me tell my story and and hang out for an hour I appreciate yeah. it and for everyone who's going to hear this on the recording which is a lot of people so yeah um, yeah yeah Absolutely. All right, everyone. Well, Jillian, thank you. Our producer back there behind the slow walk sign is going to take us out with the song Slow Walk. We'll see you next month. <laughs> oh, actually, Bye -bye. next month. We'll tell people in advance what next month is. We're going to have a conversation with Dr. Candy Can about Halloween, Day of the Dead, All Saints Day, why these holidays, what they mean, um, and what any of the holidays mean around fall and death um, and things that we've never even heard of. So we'll see you next month. All right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.